were medieval people actually religious? Well, no, and yes. Okay, maybe I should explain my answer in a little bit more depth. And a quick disclaimer here, for the purpose of this video I'll only be talking about Christianity in medieval England as a basis for my explanation. However, I would assume, based on the information I am giving, that similar countries during the medieval period and similar faiths would all fall in line with the same ideology. There is no doubt that religion has played an intrinsic role in the history of mankind. Nowhere is this more true than the medieval period. In 313 AD, the Roman Emperor Constantine issued the Edict of Milan, which granted Christianity to be a legal status as a religion. From this point, Christianity began gaining influence across the Roman Empire, including Britain. Temples were dedicated to Christian entities, as well as the older Roman and Eastern religions, although, for now at least, they were still regarded as cults, rather than fully fleshed out and respected religions. Regardless, over the years, more and more Romano-British residents opted to be buried after death, which was a chosen Christian way as opposed to the Roman religious tradition of cremation. By the 5th century AD, Christianity was easily the most mainstream religion of Romano-Britain, although the Saxon raids from mainland Europe in the mid-5th century proved to be a lengthy setback for Christianity, as temples and other religious sites were a keen target for raiders, often containing treasure and riches. The religion still pulled through, as the Saxons began to settle in Britain, they also came to terms with their own religion, which at the time were local forms of Germanic polytheism, known as paganism. A quick caveat, paganism is a religious term often thrown around by people. However, paganism is a collective word for a broad variety of religious traditions, beliefs, practices and spirituality. The term pagan is actually just a word which Romans used to describe anyone who continued to follow the polytheistic religions long after the Romans had stopped this tradition. Polytheistic meaning that you celebrated multiple gods rather than one. The same confusion arises from the term barbarian. We often hear that word and think of strong, wild men wearing furs and holding big axes. However, the term barbarian is, again, another Roman word to describe anyone who is an enemy of Rome. So, by the 600s AD, the Saxons were the new occupiers of Britain, and paganism was, again, the mainstream religion in the country. However, things were different this time. From interacting with the local Romano-British population, learning their culture, traditions, and Christian religious beliefs, they began to realise all the things that this new religion would provide for them. And no, I'm not talking about an entrance to heaven, I'm talking about trade, education, writing, and influence. The Saxons soon learned that Christianity had brought all these new traits into the Romano-British society, and the Saxons wanted to be a part of it. So, beginning in Kent, and then Northumbria, Christianity once again swooped throughout the Anglo-Saxon lands, and became the mainstream religion of Britain for a second time. One key person to note during this time was Saint Patrick, who was a Romano-British missionary during the 5th century AD, who influenced Christianity in Ireland, teaching the local Celtic people about the benefits of Christianity. The Bible will talk about magic tricks and banishing snakes from the land, However, the truth behind the tricks is that Patrick showed the locals all the benefits that being part of the Christian faith had to offer. The access to trade rights, new technologies, shift in languages, and ever-growing leaning towards a written culture. The local Celtic people knew that trade and communication with mainland Britain would inevitably be more difficult as they were aware that Christianity was becoming more and more popular as time went on. So, they agreed to follow Christianity to keep in contact with the outside world, and to learn the new educational, social, and economical benefits that Christianity could offer them. 
Indeed, in 627 AD, the town of York began work on its first Christian building, on the site of where the Gothic Minster stands today. The first building was a hurriedly constructed wooden church to baptise King Edwin of Northumbria. A decade later, a stone church was commissioned by St Oswald of Northumbria, and was dedicated to St Peter. During the late 8th and early 9th centuries, Britain was, again, subjected to violent and frequent raids from overseas. This time, longships filled with Viking raiders terrorised the coast of England, Brought back by their successful raid of Lindisfarne Priory, where many treasures were stolen and the Christian church was burnt to the ground. Moving on to the 9th century AD, as the Vikings began to settle in England, they too began to integrate themselves with the ways of the life of the local Saxon people. This, again, brought the realisation of what Christianity could offer these pagan settlers. Despite this, the Vikings did not seem to take to Christianity as well as the Saxons prior to them. The Vikings instead seemed to be more interested in the profitability of Christianity through the new trade rights, rather than the spiritual side of things. For example, it is known that the Viking traders would sometimes carry necklaces of both pagan gods as well as the Christian crucifixes with them, and wear the appropriate necklace depending on who they were trading with. This tells us that trade was restricted during the Dark Ages, depending on your religious beliefs. Going back to York now, another important thing to note is that during the 9th century, when the Vikings had become the new occupants of York, little is known about the upkeep of the Saxon church that stood there. This could be either due to the fact that the Vikings preferred to continue their traditional oral culture rather than the written culture, meaning that the local Vikings of York were not keen to learn about the education which Christianity had provided for the Saxons, or it meant that the church had simply not been viewed as an important building during this time, and therefore was not given the due care and attention that the Saxons had previously given it. Both of these reasons would result in a lack of interest in Christianity, and stubbornness to continue with their pagan traditions. Moving forward to the Norman invasion of Britain in 1066, the Normans were most definitely Christian, and were keen to push out the Vikings along with their pagan culture. Now, with the United Kingdom under Norman rule, Christianity was, for the third time, once again able to spread and be the main religion of Britain. Although it is important to understand that by now, most Viking settlers in Britain had already transferred over to the Christian faith. The Normans brought new, innovative construction methods with them, which paved the way for larger, more impressive churches. These were known as the Cathedral Builders. The Normans had also close ties with cities such as Rome and Constantinople, which were very important capitals of Christianity, as well as being devoted religious centres. Both Rome and Constantinople had a great influence over Europe during this time, meaning that keeping on the city's good side was of great benefit. With this, the Normans began to build giant cathedrals in key cities across Britain, such as Norwich, Salisbury, Winchester, and Exeter. Grand religious sites such as these kept Norman England in favour with the Pope, and in return gave the country exclusive profits from trade rights, donations and pilgrimage. Most abbeys and cathedrals would boast precious religious artefacts, such as pieces of Jesus' cross or bones of saints. These were given celebrity status and people would travel from all over the country, or indeed from abroad, to see these relics. This was known as pilgrimage, and was seen as a popular holiday, so to speak, for many people. Not only did this provide cities with a certain elevated status, but would also be very profitable through tourism. People would pay good money to see these relics, and also would be paying for local inns for somewhere to stay during their visits. The local taverns and marketplaces would also benefit from offering food and services, and Perhaps most importantly, the host cities would be talked about by all the pilgrims returning from their journeys, therefore putting these cities well and truly on the map for future trade and pilgrimage. 
The main benefits to Christianity during the medieval period was the ability to gain a wider education of the world, reading and writing, access to trade rights, and favour with the Pope. However, Christianity offered much more than this. Firstly, we need to know exactly how the Church was integrated in medieval society, which is very different to today's society. The role of the Church during the medieval period was very different than its role today. During the Middle Ages, the Church played a more administrative role and had a close relationship with the English state. Bishops and other major monastic leaders played important parts in national government, and would also often counsel the king on economic, social and military matters. Bishops also often oversaw towns and cities, managing taxation as well as the local government, a similar role to county councils today. Despite this, the church was beginning to rely on authorization from the King of England less and less over the centuries, and by the 13th century, the church had almost become completely independent from the king's word, answering almost entirely to Rome. Having firmly established its place in England, the church had become responsible for education, medicine, most local taxation, and general upkeep of the society. People would have to pay a tithe, and in return, either local landowners or the church would offer services such as building roads, bridges, churches, hospitals, schools, or providing general charity, much like paying council tax in the modern world. Due to this ongoing commitment, the townsfolk would be pledged to the church, as it provided them with helpful services and better lives overall. Therefore, the church had become rooted within the typical medieval society, in return asking for money, patronage, and to spread the good word of Christ. This brings me to the next question. Did medieval people actually believe in the words of the Bible? Now there is no way to answer this with total accuracy, as we simply cannot know what was going on in the minds of these medieval people centuries ago. And, as historical records were primarily written and kept by the church, records of atheism would surely not be recorded with sympathy in mind. Hence why it is difficult for us to hear of such stories today. It is difficult to determine if medieval folk believed in the words of the Bible, but we do know that people enjoyed the stories of the Bible, as the medieval period had a much more prominent oral tradition than in today's world, and storytelling was an important part of medieval life. As discussed before, there would be very real, worldly consequences for publicly denouncing God, such as being exiled from your local community, fines, imprisonment, and even execution. The safest option, therefore, would be to just play the game and keep your head down. The church offered more positives than negatives for medieval folk, so falling in line was seen as the logical choice, similar to keeping your head down and agreeing with your boss at work, because it's easier just to agree and keep your job than to disagree and be looked upon unfavourably by someone who can control your job security. One important note is that the Bible stories would have also helped to expand people's minds, thinking of a larger world rather than just their farm boundaries. A world rich with stories, history, tradition and culture, sparking the imagination. As well as this, the Bible, in its roots, also taught morality and good behaviour. A helping hand towards the leading of a good life, teaching kindness and compassion to one another. The morals of various Bible stories would have also been constantly preached during church services and in day-to-day -day life, an attempt to make sure that people respected authority and worked towards the warning of repercussions for negative actions. So, we have discussed the place that Christianity had in medieval society, the roles it filled and the services it provided for the people of medieval England. Now let's delve into some examples of why people may not have been quite so religiously minded as they initially seemed. My own local city, Norwich, has the intriguing honour of being the only English city to be excommunicated by the Pope. Following a riot which broke out due to a disagreement and subsequent violence between the townsfolk of Norwich and the monks of Norwich Cathedral, 
The Pope excommunicated the entire city and its townsfolk, dubbing them to be the disinherited. So, you now have a city of the damned, cast out by the Pope of Rome, supposedly on behalf of Christ. Surely, this city would be then abandoned and left for ruin, right? Well, in the decades that followed, Norwich saw a tremendous expansion of trade rights, a gigantic increase of wealth, and a burst in population as people flocked from all over Europe to trade and settle in Norwich. Many guilds were set up, the wool trade exploded, and Norwich found itself spending its newfound wealth on glorious architecture such as the expansion of its many friaries, the city walls and many gatehouses, and the churches. And the most churches of any city in England, and indeed of any city in Europe north of the Alps. This just goes to show that people seem to have no qualms in trading with these so-called disinherited people of Norwich, as money had always been more important to them than their religious beliefs. Surely, if medieval people truly believed in the words of religion as strict as history would have us believe, the traders and merchants would stay far away from trading with such a city and its townsfolk. Indeed, it was during this time that Norwich began stretching its markets as far as Scandinavia and Spain taking vast voyages to buy and sell goods with distant countries who would have definitely heard about the news of Norwich's excommunication from the Pope. It appeared that nobody really cared what the Pope had to say in this instance, and if the Pope was truly an earthbound communicator of God, it meant that nobody would really care what God had to say either. For my next example, we move forward in time to 1513 and the Scottish-English border. James IV of Scotland had fell out of favour with the English monarch, King Henry VIII, and he planned an invasion of England. King James gathered some 42,000 men and prepared to besiege the English castles of Norham, Walk-on-Tweed, Etal, and Ford on the Scottish border. When Pope Julius II heard about the Scottish King's plans, he was furious. How dare he declare war on England, who at the time was a friend of the Papal State? Following the Pope's death later that year, the new Pope, Leo X, sent a letter to King James, threatening him with excommunication if he proceeded with his plans to invade England from the north. Disregarding this warning, the King of Scotland mobilised his army and crossed the border, officially declaring war on England. So hold up, not only has the King of Scotland decided to go against the guidance of the Pope, and therefore God, but also all of his 42,000 men who he raised weren't phased by this and were happy to follow a condemned king and fight a country who was said to be protected by the Pope and therefore God himself. Why would so many people be comfortable fighting on the side of declared evil if they believed in the words of the Bible and the warnings about what would happen to you if you were cast down to the fiery pits of hell? Evidently, these men, who were normal, free-thinking people like you and I, decided that they did not believe in the words of the Pope, or God, or indeed care what they had to say, and figured that getting paid to do their job as a soldier in this mortal life was more important to them than risking their lives to eternal damnation. These people clearly did not believe in God to an extent where they devoted their lives and life choices to such a deity. It should also be noted, however, that King James IV was indeed killed at the Battle of Flodden on 9th of September 1513, and was in fact still exiled at the time of his death. To be clear, this video is merely stating the roles of the church in medieval England, and how the common person would have thought about the religion as a free thinker. It is therefore up to you to decide whether you think medieval people truly believed in religion and the Bible, and what effects it had on their decision making throughout their daily lives. And this video aids in my quest to paint a true picture of medieval life, and how it was more colourful, rich and fulfilling than what some books, TV series and indeed Hollywood would have us believe. I hope you enjoyed this video, feel free to give me a like and subscribe for more historical content. I cover a wide range of subjects such as the history of various historic sites I visit, history you may not have known about, hidden ruins, talks and discussion on misconceptions throughout history, medieval arms and armour, and general history from Neolithic to medieval and beyond. Also consider following me on Instagram where I post photos of my travels, 
local Norfolk historic sites, and my own medieval reenactment including full contact combat.